My name is Tom Evers. I'm the executive director with the Minneapolis Parks Foundation. And thank you for joining us tonight for our Next Generation of Parks lecture series. Um, before we start the program, I want to just make a few remarks uh, and, and say some thank yous and um, uh, talk a little bit about this lecture series. Um, so the Minneapolis Parks Foundation, we are an independent nonprofit who, uh, with a mission that is to transform parks and public spaces by aligning community uh, philanthropic investment and community vision. Uh, we believe that parks have the power to heal, to connect us, to make us whole. And we're, uh, we're really thrilled to, to have you all here for the Next Generation of Park Lecture Series. Um, this is actually the 10th season. Um, how many folks have been to one of these lectures before? Excellent, thank you for returning. Um, it's one of our highlights of what we do. Um, and the idea is really that we uh, infuse good ideas in the community. We, we look around the world, around the country, and find folks who are doing really amazing things and bring them here learn from them, and then let our imaginations take those lessons and apply them here with the Minneapolis uh, park system. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to, many of you know, the Minneapolis park system, uh, which is managed by the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board, is continually recognized as one of the best in the country. Um, and it's really easy for us to rest on those laurels um, and celebrate them, and we should. Um, and one area that I wanna highlight is we often talk about the park system, um, in terms of the parks, the places, the connections. But one of the things that I've seen um, as a partner with the park board and, and the city is that uh, the, CIST, the park system, the park board is filled with incredible staff and incredible people. And I, I think it's really worth noting that one of the things is we have um, a world-class uh, workforce working in the park system, yeah. And it's, uh, so I just wanna, we are, we're standing on those shoulders of, of those who are doing it today and those who've done it in the past and we're really, excited to celebrate that. But the other thing that the Park Foundation does and part of this next generation is to push us, to think more about how do our, park serve, our parks serve our city. And, um, and so this lecture series has been rooted in that, of looking around the country and, and thinking about great ideas and thinking about how we can push our edges and what ideas can we apply here. And what's really exciting is that um, is that, uh, and, and we do this under several themes. So the Parks Foundation looks at uh, how do we think about our parks and where do they transform lives. And really there's five guiding themes that we think about as we apply our work. Um, that is um, racial and economic equity. There's, there's work to be done to make sure our city and our park system serves everyone um, across the board and, uh, and, and deals with some disparities in the past that still exist with us. Um, you know, even going to the back to the fact that we are on land that was once Dakota and Ojibwe. Um, we still have work to do there. Um, health and wellness. Our parks are here to improve our health, improve our wellness. Um, they're also, uh, we need to turn to our parks to address climate resiliency. The world's changing around us, and in our cities we need to think about multiple la layers in which our parks address um, some of those, and meet some of those uh, new challenges. Um, connectedness to nature in itself is a value that often you can't monetize, but it's really critical for us to be fully human, and that's another value our parks add. Um, and then economic vitality. It is part of what makes this region great is the park system. So we, as we do our work, we continue to think about those. And with all that in mind, it's why I'm thrilled to be here tonight. We didn't have to look far to find one of the best um, speakers in the country, one of the foremost authorities, Dr. Spivak, to talk about um, pollinators and bees. And really, it's uh, sometimes we look too far out to not realize the talent that exists in our in our in our own community. So we're thrilled to do to have her here. Um, before we begin, I want to just thank a few folks uh, and then introduce um, Elizabeth Dunbar, who will get the program going. Um, I definitely want to thank uh, NPR News. Minnesota Public Radio has been a key partner in this series. Um, their dedication to the series, uh, bringing talent to help uh, to help draw out the conversation, has made this has has really elevated this uh, lecture series. Um, the Walker Art Center. Thank you for helping co-produce these events. Um, this is our 10th year in the partnership. Uh, we do these events around the, around the city, but it's great to always return here. Um, and we also have sponsors who help pay for this to make this a free event, which is one of the qualities of these lecture series is that they are free and open to the public. So please spread the word. Um, but we, uh, Bar Engineering and Ameriprise Financial has helped underwrite uh, the lecture series this season. And please, uh, it, it allows us to continue to do this. 
And then also the uh, our Parks Foundation donors, our board members. Um, there's several in the room. If you're a Parks Foundation board member, can you raise your hand? Thank you. Um, these are folks and volunteers who, who help us do our good work, so thank you. Um, but our donors, all of you who help, uh, help us do this work, um, it's, it's because you were able to continue to do this and work alongside the park board and the city. So um, your support plays a vital role in helping us bring people here. So thank you for that support. Um, so I'm really excited to, to introduce Elizabeth Dunbar, who will get the program going. Uh, she will introduce our guest speaker, and then, then they'll have a conversation following the remarks. Uh, Elizabeth is currently an editor with NPR News, but she's perfect for this because prior to that, she had spent six years reporting on a, on a series of environment, variety of environmental issues, uh, including a project on climate change that won the Kav Kavli Science Journalist Award uh, from the American Association of Advancement of Science. Um, more recently, she's been experimenting with audience engagement, and we were just talking about that earlier. It's just a fascinating uh, way that journalism is heading, um, including a project that involved convening rural uh, Minnesota farmers and Twin Cities consumers in a dialogue about the future of agriculture in a changing climate. I mean, it's really exciting about how journalism is going where people are having the conversations. Um, Elizabeth grew up in Iowa and has a journalism degree from the University of Minnesota. She'll introduce um, Dr. Spivak more, more better than I will, and also then host the conversation. So thank you for joining us and and Elizabeth, thanks for Good evening. Uh, Marla Spivak's interest in bees began when she worked as a commercial beekeeper in New Mexico in the 70s. Um, she went on to get her PhD at the University of Kansas for her work in identifying and studying the ecology of Africanized and European honeybees in Costa Rica. Sounds pretty good right now to go to Costa Rica. Uh, she did postdoc work at the University of Arizona before coming to the University of Minnesota in 1993, and she's done some amazing work there uh, since then. And along with fellow researcher Gary Ruder, Spivak bred a line of honeybees, the Minnesota Hygienic Line, to defend themselves against diseases and parasitic mites. Her current research includes studies on the benefits of plant resins to honeybees and the effects of agricultural landscapes and pesticides on bee health. Marla Spivak is a MacArthur Fellow and McKnight Distinguished Professor in Entomology, and I'm so excited to hear what she has to say tonight. Please give her a warm welcome. Hi. <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, thank you for allowing me to talk about what I love to talk about, and that's bees and pollinators and how we can help them. So um, I guess we'll get going. The title is Parks and Pollinators, but what I plan to do in the next about 30 minutes is to start at the beginning and give some basics. Many of you have heard me speak or know the basics about bees and why it's so important to give them good nutrition and how we do that. But I need to walk through that so I can set the stage for then moving into the parks and how we can basically feed bees in our parks and how we got there. Then I'm gonna take, I'm gonna pivot and have some fun because I'm gonna talk briefly about a research project of one of my PhD students, how she uses the dance language of honeybees to have the bees tell us where they've been foraging. And then in the end, I'm going to zoom out really big, I hope, and um, talk about some bigger is issues and visions and where I would like to go with all of the enthusiasm we have right now about pollinators. So here we go. Most people, when we think about bees, think immediately about our honeybees. They are not native to the United States, but they've been here over 400 years, so I think they're naturalized. Maybe they have their green card by now, I don't know. They were a good import, I would say. And um, they live in huge colonies. They have about 50,000 individuals within the nest. They uh, make a lot of honey, that's why they were introduced, because we can harvest honey from their nest. But how there are in Minnesota, we estimate over 425 species of bees. 
They're wild. The vast majority of them are native here, and they don't live in great big colonies. They live in the ground or they live in stems. They live by themselves. Uh, we have very little information about where they're living and their conditions because there's so many of them. What we do know is that they're beautiful. <laughs> And they're fascinating, every, every one of them. If you haven't already, I'd like you to meet your state bee. The Minnesota le legislature last year passed uh, this resolution to make the rusty patch bumblebee our state bee. So what's interesting about that is this particular bumblebee species is on the uh, federal, federally endangered species list. It was listed several years back. It was one of the first... Uh, insect species to be listed like this, or the first bee in particular on the mainland in the United States. It's hard to see. When I first moved in Minnesota, it was very, very common. When we would go out bumblebee hunting, we'd find Bombus aphanus, the rusty patch, all over the place. And now we just don't see it. So one of the very few places it can still be found is in the Twin Cities and in our parks on some of the flowers. And so as not as a token, but I think our legislators wanted to, to have the state of Minnesota remember and really think about our pollinators in this state and how we can bring back this beautiful species to be more abundant or as abundant as it used to be. So if you see this bee this summer, take a photo, take one in, fo in focus and, and submit it to the bumblebee watch. We're, we're trying to figure out where they are. You can help us look for them. All right, so why are bees declining? And there's many ways to show this, but most people that do research on bees agree that there's the four Ps of bee decline. Pathogens and parasites, and that's probably the biggest problem, actually. Those are internal to the bee. I put a diagram of honeybees, but actually bumblebees, and, uh, and we're learning about all our other wild bees, have their own pathogens and parasites, and sometimes at levels that are scary. And it is hypothesized, actually, that uh, internal gut parasite is why some of the bumblebee species are in such severe decline. Pesticides are a problem for many things, for all of our bees. I'm going to be focusing today on, the, on the, what we had to call it, to have it fit with the P, we called it poor nutrition. But on the nutrition part of this, I'm happy to answer questions on anything, on any of these, but I'm going to be focusing on the nutrition part this evening. So as we all know, our nutrition is dependent on bee pollination. So bees go and pollinate fruits and vegetables and flowers, and Whole Foods did this campaign showing what it would be like in our lives if we had no bees at all, and it's pretty sad looking grocery store, produce department of the grocery store, and when they're pollinating flowers, they're obtaining their own nutrition. So we rely on bees and other pollinators to pollinate our nutritious foods. And in turn, the bees are relying on flowers to get their nutrition. And of course, the pollen and the nectar are what they're eating. The pollen is protein and lipids, and the nectar is carbohydrates. But I want to focus on the value added <laughs> compounds that are in pollen and nectar. So this is the research that I'm citing I've boxed and, and I hope you go read it. It's pretty technical. But one of my heroes in bee research, Mae Birnbaum, and her students did this work. And they show that there's phytocompounds. These are plant chemistries, plant compounds in floral nectar and floral pollen that trigger gene expression that turn on genes within the bee. And those genes make proteins that are part of their immune system. And they also make enzymes that help bees detoxify pesticides. Now, we all have those enzymes. But for bees, it's very important that they have a lot of them. And the way they're getting those enzymes and the P450 system to detoxify is through their diet. When they have really good pollen and nectar, they're getting those phytochemicals. It's like us eating uh, blueberries, right? And getting the antioxidants, the value added part of the fruit. That's 
similar to the plant compounds that the bees are getting from floral nectar and pollen. And so that's the primer on bee nutrition. <laughs> we need more flowers for our, all of our pollinators, our butterflies, our other beneficial insects, because guess what? There's a lot of beneficial insects out there that prey on other pest insects. We need more flowers so they can restore their immune function and detoxify pesticides. In addition, honeybees need one other product, and this is the, what we've been studying in the lab for many years now, and that is that honeybees collect plant resins from some plants. And these, I loaded this slide up with pictures because I want to walk through the whole thing. These plant resins are antimicrobial. In other words, they're medicinal. So plants, some plants produce resins because they protect the leaf or the plant from um, pathogens, they protect it, the plant from herbivory. So they're a plant defense. So a plant secretes the resins, which you see on the left hand, and you're looking at a leaf bud of um, a cottonwood tree. And then honeybees go and they find these trees, in this case, mostly trees here, that are producing these resin, and they scrape the resin right off the leaf bud, and they pack it on their hind legs. So the top picture is a tree, actually, as a bee, actually in Brazil, gathering a green propolis, and right under that is a bee in a colony here in Minnesota with yellow on her hind legs, and that's resin. Okay, resin equals propolis. So maybe you know of propolis or propolis. Some people, I don't think it matters how you pronounce it, but the resins, once they're inside of a bee colony, we call them propolis or propolis, but it's just <laughs> resin. Okay, so there's a bee with resin on her hind legs, and then it's so sticky, these resins, that the bees can't get it off their legs themselves. So another bee, other bees in the colony, remove the resin from that other bee with their mouth parts, and then they use it as cement. They use it to crack uh, crevices within the colony, and in wild, in uh, where bees nest naturally, where honeybees nest naturally in tree cavities, they kind of coat the whole interior of the tree with a layer of this propolis, like a varnish layer, and it's medicinal to them. So we've been studying the benefits of these tree resins to them, and it's it's very important to honeybees to have a lot of propolis within the nest for their immune function and to help fight off disease. And then recently, we've students in the lab right now are finding that it actually helps their microbiomes, the gut microbiota and the microbiomes that are on their bodies, because it's the antimicrobial properties of the resins are killing off all the pathogenic or opportunistic bacteria, allowing the core bacteria, the beneficial ones, to grow and do their thing. It's cool. All right, so bees in our area are collecting most of their resins from cottonwood, it turns out, and anything in the genus Populus. So that would include balsam poplar or hybrid poplars. They can collect from other things, but every time we've observed and collected resin, it's mostly from cottonwood. So there's something we can be growing in our parks, more cottonwoods, in addition to the flowers that we need. So the way my association with Minneapolis Park started was several years back, probably around six years back, when I ride my bike around town and I had a day where I started, all I could see was lawns, and I got perturbed. <laughs> and I, was, I just went into this big thing about what are we doing? What is this lawn? What are lawns? Why do we have lawns? What's the history of the lawn? How did this come to be? Why do we think that this monoculture is beautiful? And more, what I was thinking, boy, I wish there were flowers all over that, because look at all that surface area for bee forage. Why can't we turn this into, or some of our lawns at least, into bee lawns? So I submitted a proposal to our Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund. So this is some of your lottery money goes into this trust fund. And people can apply for grants um, 
to do research or land, even land acquisition. And so I was fortunate enough to be awarded two series of grants and three graduate students that you're seeing over there, Ian and James and Hannah, got degrees from this project. So what we wanted to do is figure out what flowers could we put, will grow in turf, that you can continue to mow, since humans seem to have this need to mow <laughs> and to keep things manicured. So actually for me, this was like, an entry into how can we start converting some landscapes in this very subtle way into, into landscapes that are not only beneficial to bees, but for other things too. So if we could come up with flowers in lawns that were not your typical dandelion or creeping charlie, if we could come up with other species, maybe some native species that would not be outcompeted by the grass, that would grow, that we could mow, then maybe we would use less herbicide. And maybe we would use less insecticide. And maybe we would mow less often. So this high input thing could turn into, think, into something that could bloom. So we started by looking at just white clover. So white clover, if you remember, used to be in almost all of our lawns. Just little, we, I call it Dutch clover, white clover. Um, let me move on a little bit. Because I first want to say, I want to talk about Mary Lynn Pulsher here, who's right there. I can see her. <laughs> Mary Lynn, thank you for your help with this. Um, and the other professors that I worked with, Dr. Eric Watkins was a turf specialist, and Kristen Nelson is actually a conservation biologist, but also a sociologist, and allowed us to do surveys of people in parks to see what they thought about these things. So with Mary Lynn's help, we were able to find four, actually eight parks. And the first thing we did was just survey, I'm going to go back one, survey the bees that were just on white clover. So two or three years worth of surveying, just walking transects through white clover, what bees do we see? We were blown away. There are f over 50 species of bees that feed just on or visit <coughs> white clover. So it's not just honeybees. Most, they were pretty prevalent, the honeybees, but there were many, many species of our wild native bees foraging on white clover. So just that flower alone is a great start. And then what we wanted to do is, well, what else could we add? So we put in Prunella vulgaris, it's called self-heal, it's a native plant, it's native throughout most of the United States. We put in some creeping thyme, which is not native, but it blooms a little bit later than the prunella, than the self-heal. And in some areas, we didn't get it established very well in the parks, but astragalus is another that in some soil types is another good flowering plant, um, the ground plum. And then when we started evaluating and surveying the bees on all these plants, we found that when we added a few species, we started seeing new species coming in. And we started seeing that the bees would partition. There were some bees that would only be found on the prunella and not go on clover. So we could provide more food for more bees, more specialist bees, and then keep them from overlapping on the same, on the same flowers. So we've, we've had um, field days. We did surveys. We found that most, <laughs> it was remarkable, um, the survey results that Hannah Raymer found. The majority of people surveyed were really in favor of having areas within parks that had flowers that would provide food for pollinators. We thought most everybody would say, we're really afraid of bees, what if we get stung? But that really wasn't people's main concern. They did bring it up, but mostly they said, no, we like this idea. We like the idea of flowering lawns, we like the idea of providing food for pollinators. So we've written up a how-to how do you do this thing? It's on our website. It's on, if you just go to the Bee Lab, University of Minnesota, and search around a little bit, you'll end up <laughs> with lots of information about the flowering lawns, how to, how to do them. After that, kind of fast forward a little bit, because a number of us sat on 
uh, Governor Dayton appointed a task force to, to make recommendations to the legislature on how to improve the world for pollinators. And I was fortunate enough, enough to sit on that uh, panel, that task force. And one of the things that got picked up by the legislature just this last year was providing incentives to homeowners and communities to put in pollinator habitat. And they called it the Lawn to Legumes Program, which just warmed my heart, because it's not all just about uh, bee lawns and putting in clover, although it kind of took on that name to begin with. It's much, much bigger than that. And it's being administered by the Board of Water and Soil Resources, Dan Shaw and his people, and they've done an amazing job. So if you go to Bowser's Board of uh, Water and Soil Resources, if you go to their website, you can get all of this information. If you're quick, due in two days, <laughs> you can submit an application for individual support to put in pollinator-friendly plants in your yard and get um, a reimbursed up to $300, $350 for doing that. The other program for the de demonstration neighborhood grants, that's already been submitted. They're already reviewing the applications. The best part about all of this is that Bowser got slammed with requests. It's just great. So many people in this city, the, these cities, <laughs> Twin Cities, are really interested in putting in habitat for pollinators. And Dan kind of um, freaked out at first when people were calling the office saying, how do I get money for this? <laughs> so never fear, he, the, he and his group put together this very comprehensive guide, which you can download from their website on planting for pollinators. What to, at small, medium, large, different seed mixtures, how to prepare the site for it, how to maintain it once you put it in. So all, now we have really, really good instructions out there for putting in pollinator habitat. They have a webinar on how to do it. So now it's not just go out there and plant flowers. We really, at least in this state, have very good guides on how to. He put together, they put together an amazing pollinator toolkit for funding, for working with their programs, for creating residential and park pollinator habitat. So if you're look, if you want to know how, that's where you go. We have excellent resources now. So I'm going to pivot, just because this is a super fun project, and then I'll come back around to more habitat. So up in the left, that's Morgan, Morgan Carmarkel. She's a PhD student in my lab, and her question was, okay, so a lot of people want to plant and restore our prairies. They want to plant native species, diverse native species, which is wonderful. That will be wonderful for our native bees and our butterflies. But will honeybees really use those flowers? And I'll explain why we came up with that question. So when honeybees forage, when, they, when a scout bee, a, a, a scout bee is one that's kind of going out looking for new grocery stores, basically. When a scout bee goes out and finds a patch of flowers that she finds profitable, meaning there's lots of them, they have a lot of nectar, a lot of pollen, they, you know, they're just great food resources, that bee will come back to the colony and do a waggle dance. And that waggle dance is an advertisement to the other bees in the colony to go out and check it out, okay? If their resources aren't good enough, bees don't dance. So they only dance when that particular bee deems it profitable, when she says, well, that was, that was amazing. I'm going to tell everybody about this. And she comes back in and does this waggle dance. In a restored prairie, our goal is to put in many diverse species and not necessarily in big plumps like we would in a garden. 
And so when, when a honeybee goes and finds different resources in a restored prairie, would they be arranged or good enough for her to actually advertise, go back to the nest and, and waggle? So we did this in several locations. Uh, one of them was down um, at Carleton College in their arboretum. They have some big restored prairies. I'm just going to show you the one from Bellwin Conservancy, which is over by Afton. They have these sites that are outlined in green that are restored prairie. They're established. They're beautiful. And right in the middle where that star is, is where we took some honeybee colonies. So we took an old fishing hut, an ice fishing hut, and we converted it into a shed where we would put three different small colonies of bees. And they have glass walls on part of it so that we can observe the bees within the colony. And then they fly in and out of a tube in and out of the shed into the prairie or wherever they want to forage. And we, re we video recorded any bee that came back. We, I say we. Morgan video recorded <laughs> the dances of bees as they came back in. And then if the bee had some pollen on her legs, if she found a pollen source, then we had little doors, not a great photo, but we, we had little, they were actually plexiglass, and we had little portals that she could remove, reach in, grab the bee that was dancing, gently remove the pollen, and then release the bee so we weren't hurting the bee. And then she took the pollen, and then we could identify that to flower species. So the dance tells us where the bee went, and the pollen tells us what they actually got when they went there. So we can take that pollen, and under a microscope, lower left has different pollen grains under a microscope. So we can identify uh, the, the morphology, the shapes of the pollen to floral species. Sometimes we can't get down to species. And so we use um, DNA sequencing to supplement the morphology, and so we can get a pretty good idea from the pollen, what flowers it came from. And then we can decode the dance language. Morgan can decode the dance language. <laughs> okay. So how a bee dances communicates the distance and the direction that she went to find those flowers. So I'm going to show you a little bit of video. Um, it's behind that plexiglass, so it's not so this line here you're looking at is important because that's our plumb line. That lets us know where is vertical. And under that, you'll see a bee that's painted white on her thorax, on her back, and she's waggling up and then coming back around. And there's another bee that's yellow, kind of in the middle, and she's waggling and coming back around. Do you see them? Those are waggle dances. So the, the waggling the duration of that waggle run is correlated with how far away it is. And the angle of the bee's waggle relative to vertical tells us the direction. So these bees are dancing with their heads straight up, which means the food source is in the direction toward the sun. And so to translate this to human, this would mean if I was a bee, I'd come to the front door of the hive, I'd go, where's the sun? Oh, there it is. I'm going to go that way. OK? <laughs> so the bee's angle, the angle of her dance can shift. So there is some error in the bee's dance. They're not always perfect. They kind of, their dances are a little loose. So what we have to do once we decode and relative to the sun at that time of year, and et cetera, et cetera, is we get these probability density distributions, or these heat maps telling us the probability that the bees are dancing in a particular area. And the darker, the, the pinks and purples are really high probability, and as they get into light blue, they're lower probability. So you can see the scatter plot, basically. And so there's the prairies again, this time outlined in white. And you can see in one of them, the bees were foraging fairly heavily, where that pink and the blues are in the lower one. And then you see a bunch of bees <laughs> dancing off the prairie to native plants, which means, yay, people are planting native species outside the prairie areas, and the bees are finding them. Okay? Mostly from the pollen, we know they were foraging on within the prairie on Dahlia purpurea, which is purple prairie clover. And then when the goldenrod, solidago, bloomed, they were there in mass. 
the honeybees really only visited the prairies in mass when goldenrod blooms, so later in the season, August, September. So that's the same information on the left. And mostly they were going to non-native plants that grow in great big clumps, like the clovers and the bird's foot trefoil. That's mostly what they were foraging on. They had many other species they were, they were foraging on. You can see the upper prairie actually had a, not, a bunch of non-native species in it, which was kind of revealing to the folks at Belwyn. They said, whoa, that's not what they had intended. But that particular one has some non-native clovers that were growing in it. The take-home message on this is kind of interesting. It, I mean, we kind of, I, I kind of expected that the bees, honeybees, would not be foraging very much in the prairies until, for example, goldenrod bloomed. But this means their un, honeybees are unlikely to collect large portions of their diet from prairies until goldenrod. So that means they're in there scouting, and they will, you will see honeybees in these restored prairies. But it also means that they're not in there competing with our native species, our wild bees, who also need a lot of forage and a lot of undisturbed forage. And they deserve to not be outcompeted all the time by honeybees. So in my mind, it's kind of good news that you can put in a restored prairie and it won't be swamped out by honeybees, that the honeybees will go to other species. We could plant different species for honeybees. So. I think it was really good news. OK. I'm going to take the next just a few minutes to zoom way out and talk more about all of the enthusiasm that you have and that many people have to put in pollinator habitat. What I think our next step is is not just to put in pollinator habitat for the pollinators. Well, we need to do that. But we need to realize and emphasize that when we do that, we can, re we can improve soil quality, and we can improve water quality, and we can address and mitigate some climate change or climate resiliency things that we were talking about earlier. So how does this work? How does that connect? Seems like a big leap, but it's not at all. So when you have, and I hope you can see this fairly well, but it's soil and the root system, and then a bunch of plants above it, right? You can see that? OK. When you keep plants on the ground, especially native flowering species with very long roots, you have pollinator habitat. It keeps a cover on the ground year round, these perennial plants. And they provide not only pollinator habitat, but bird habitat and other wildlife habitat. So there's multiple benefits to this. Even if you put a plant in an agricultural setting, a cover crop, even if the roots aren't that long, the green cover crop and just having roots in the ground at all times then stores carbon in the soil. The roots prevent soil erosion, especially long roots like that, and filter pollutants. And so if you're putting pollinator habitat, if you think about places to put it, along areas where there's riparian areas, where there's water, buffers, uh, rain gardens in the city, storm runoff. If you put pollinator habitat, especially the native species with these long roots next to it, you can be providing and helping us get clean water that way. It's not a big, it's just doing what we're doing, but realizing that the benefits of what we're doing and what we're planting in our parks and everywhere can benefit so many other things. There's a lot of talk about regenerative agriculture right now. And if you don't know what this is, I really encourage you to go look at this. I think this is the way of the future. This, it doesn't have to be in just agriculture either. So regenerative agriculture is building things from the soil up, making sure the soil is healthy, making sure you don't till so that there's always something in the ground at all times to hold the soil in place. There's grazing of animals and rotational grazing and, um, and no tilling. And it's putting carbon into the soil. The plants are getting the carbon dioxide. They're putting carbon in the soil. It's retaining water. 
this agriculture, when you move to this, it diversifies our agricultural systems. But if you, if you just take, you don't have to have the word agriculture in there. This can be regenerative park landscapes. This can be regenerative urban landscapes. This is, you don't have to just wait and do this on farms. General Mills is really putting a lot of emphasis and a lot of their money into generative, regenerative agriculture. I am so proud of <laughs> General Mills. All right, so diversity is a greater goal. And this is also zooming out of what we're doing with pollinator habitat. So as we think about pollinators, we think about diverse floral landscape. This is a friend of mine right in St. Paul, Susan Damon, who's got this most amazing front yard. Many of our yards can be like this. This is for step six after the bee lawn, after the manicured lawn. You just take out the whole lawn and go for it, <laughs> like this. When you have diverse species like that, we can have diverse landscapes. We can have more diverse agriculture, which leads to more diverse nutrition and crops that we're growing. And I just threw this in here, diverse cultures, diverse views. Diversity is a greater goal. And when we have diversity, we can support all of our diverse bees. That will support many kinds of diverse flowers. And the diverse flowers then, some of them that are food for us, give us diversity in our diet. All of these things, when we put more flowers in the ground, especially when we're thinking about the root structure underground and the soil and water quality and carbon within the soil, then we're working on improving our world. It's so hopeful to me that all we have to do is plant some flowers to make steps toward things like climate change. Usually when we think about it, it's so daunting and so depressing. What do we do? So go plant some pollinator habitat and you'll be doing huge steps. And I'm going to end there, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, we are going to take questions from the audience. So there will be people handing out some cards, and you might already have a card, but you can write your question down, and we'll collect them, and uh, we'll get them up here. Um, but I'll start. Um, <laughs> And one thing that struck me about your talk is, you know, you talked about people's lawns and you talked about parks. You talked about all of these urban places that are adding pollinator habitat. Right. And then I was wondering, like, how does that, we could have a whole Twin Cities be pollinator friendly, but then you go outside and you've got agriculture, large scale agriculture, right. Right. soybeans, corn is the, are the main crops. And so how does, the, how does that transition? Because right. we're, we're seeing good things happening here. Right. Another project we have going on in the lab, which I didn't put up here, is one with, led by Dan Caravo, Dr. Dan Caravo. And he's a native bee ecologist. And he's out working in southwest Minnesota, which is predominantly corn and soybeans. Mm -hmm. And he has, I don't know how many farmers that have taken soybean out of production to put in pollinator habitat for a study that Dan wants to do. So he has, he put in, they took soybean out on places on their farms where they know that are not producing, that are not, um, they don't always give a good crop of low soybeans. Low yield. Low yield, thank yes. you. And instead they put in this pollinator habitat. All the farmers understand and growers understand where on their farms are places where they could pull up their soybeans or corn and put in habitat, and they're really happy to do so. They would prefer that there would be some money to do that, and because Dan had a grant, was able to help pay for the planting of that. Mm -hmm. So I think in our farm bill, go zooming way out, mm -hmm. um, we incentivize corn and soybeans. 
how do we incentivize some pollinator plantings? Because I think this research is going to find that it brings in beneficial insects that can be predators on the pests of soybeans and maybe on corn. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it'll do more benefit than harm for sure. We mm -hmm. have an economist working on it also mm -hmm. to look at that cost benefit. So I think once we, once we use some of those growers as examples and once they see that, wow, you can have some flowers on your farm mm -hmm. and that it's actually improving yield maybe of other crops, mm -hmm. maybe of soybean, not necessarily of corn, then maybe we can diversify the agricultural landscape. Mm -hmm. And you left us with a really hopeful message, but I wanna remind us that we're seeing climate change happening right now in Minnesota and um, we're seeing warmer winters, we're seeing heavier rains. Yeah. How are those effects having an impact on our pollinators? Right, so honeybees, because they're so social and they regulate their temperature, they're not affected so much by warm or cold per se, but how our bees are affected is when floral blooms happen and there's wild bees in the ground and the flowers bloom before or after they emerge from the ground and they get out of sync out mm -hmm. of phenology with the flowers that they need for food and this will happen most with our what we call our specialist bees mm -hmm. those that rely on just a few species so if that bee comes out of the ground in spring and that flower has already done blooming is already mm -hmm. done those bees are out of luck do we have some questions already? I don't like to go into the depressing things. Now. OK. Ask me. Well, you know, I'm the journalist, so I yeah, got to. It's OK. <laughs> OK, this is a good one. How do we prevent mice and rats in pollinator-friendly yards? Mice and rats. I don't mind mice. <laughs> I haven't seen rats. And I have a front yard that's kind of like Susan's. Hers is more beautiful than mine, so I show hers. But I see frogs. I see, I haven't seen mice. I see a lot of bunnies. Yeah. But I haven't seen mice. Uh, you know, I think they have, people may disagree with me, but I think mice and rats have a right to live too. And if they're in your front yard in the prairie and it's so thick or your gardens and mm -hmm. it's, you don't really see them. Yeah, all right. I don't um, know. They just have to make sure your house by fall doesn't have any places for them to come in. That's right. <laughs> Easier said than done, right? Um, does Creeping Charlie have any value to pollinators? I've seen lots of bees on my Creeping Charlie, but. Yes, Creeping Charlie, uh, honeybees do like Creeping Charlie. It just doesn't bloom for very long in mm. the spring when it does bloom. But yes, bees do like it. Um, so, you know, if your yard is mostly Creeping Charlie and you just can't deal, you know, then just say, okay, it's for the pollinators and put up a little sign and just say, this is, it's bee food. And, and then your neighbors will... Well, they'll do what they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are native or wild bees impacted by the four Ps that you had in your lecture as much as honeybees? That's, a, that's an interesting one. Mostly the answer is we don't know because we don't know much about where all these wild bees live. They live in the ground. We don't know. When we do surveys of bees on flowers, we can see pathogens. In, some, in many of our wild bees, especially a pathogen called nosema, and there's different kinds of nosema. It's a gut pathogen. So our bumblebees are full of them, and they also have trypanosomes <laughs> in mm -hmm. them. So yes, our native bees do have diseases. Our honeybees, because they're managed, and because we transport them and we purchase bees to be brought over to us, uh, the backyard beekeepers, they tend, to, and we keep them in high densities, the disease loads in honeybees can increase cr quickly and be transmitted horizontally among colonies mm -hmm. very quickly. But the same four things are affecting all the bees, yes. Mm -hmm. And are native bees as helpful to pollination? As yes, they bees? are. And, 
the native bees are very good pollinators. And in fact, there's studies that show if you have many kinds of pollinators, that they kind of help each other. So a honeybee may go in there and scramble up <laughs> the flower and get pollen loose, and another bee then will come and get it and collect it, a native bee, and then move it to another flower. And so among them, their collective work on flowers is, leads to really efficient and effective pollination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this person wants to hear your thoughts on the maintenance of bee be friendly landscapes. So yeah. how do you maintain them? How do you build knowledgeable workforce to take care of them? And how do you pay for be friendly landscapes? Ooh, big question. Yeah. yeah. So the maintenance part is tricky. It's not just throwing some seed out there. First of all, you have to do a lot of site preparation so you don't get a lot of weedy species in there. And then once you do get your pollinator planting in, whether it's a garden or it's a meadow, a prairie or whatever it is, there is some maintenance. If you get weedy species in there, you have to make decisions. We were at a big meeting today, conversation, mm -hmm. what do we do about Dan's, the farms that we're working in in southwest Minnesota. They're coming out with some grasses, brome, and weedy mm -hmm. species. Do we continue to mow? Do we spot spray? Don't, don't want to spot spray <laughs> herbicide. Um, just let it go and see if it do, you know, works on its own. So these are, the maintenance is a big question and it, there's no good one answer because it depends on what you're trying to maintain. Mm -hmm. Are you getting a lot of weeds? Are you getting a lot of grasses, which are really difficult? Mm -hmm. So a lot of what Bowser put up there, and there's a lot of good information from other Xerxes Society and Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. There's a lot of organizations out there right now that are giving good instructions on how to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, and then the cost, yeah. I mean, how does it compare to some of the more traditional, especially in our parks, for instance? Right. Depends on the seed mixtures that mm -hmm. you want to put in. So if you're going for a restored prairie and you want really a lot of native and diverse species, the cost of that seed is going to be, can be pretty high. If you want um, the, the seeds that we're putting in the bee lawns, they're not very expensive. The problem is now everybody wants them, so the availability isn't mm. that great. Mm -hmm. But I think then seed producers will then start growing more, especially of this prunella of the self heal, so that we can provide more seed. Mm -hmm. Those are not very expensive. Mm -hmm. How far are we in the Twin Cities, and how, how far do we need to get to achieve this healthy level of pollinator habitat? So in terms of home lawns and parks, and then, you know, are we anywhere close to having enough food for bees. I would not know what's enough. Mm. So, and, but let me try to answer that this way. The bees in my backyard produce less honey on average than they did when I first moved here. So that means to me that there's fewer flowers, but I also know that there's a whole lot more beekeepers <laughs> in the area and so they're all competing for the same flowers. Mm -hmm. So um, there, Minneapolis, St. Paul, suburbs are actually pretty good for the mm -hmm. amount of flowers that we have. I can tell this through honey production from bees, but we do need more. And the way, in my opinion, one way to get more is just less herbicide use but in addition to more planting flowers, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. uh, this question is about neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, why don't you give us an update on how, what we know about yeah. neonicotinoid pesticides on bee health, what evidence is there? So neonicotinoids is a class of insecticides. It was developed in the 90s and they are systemic, meaning they move through the plant. The thought I think the original thought was that they would get away from spraying, which was a good goal from spraying pesticides everywhere, and to keep it in the plant. So they would treat, you treat a seed, one way of applying it is to treat the seed, and then as the plant grows, the chemical moves through the, uh, it's, trans, it's translocated through the plant, and it comes out in the leaves so that it's a very toxic insecticide. It's highly toxic to 
many, many insects. And the dose that they'll put on a corn seed, for example, if there's dust off at the time of planting, the amount of pesticide coming or insecticide coming off and drifting onto flowers where bees are foraging is quite high, quite toxic. Otherwise, their exposure to bees in neonics in our rural areas, other than corn planting, is not very much. Urban areas is where the exposure can happen mm -hmm. from plants that are treated in nurseries and homeowner use of neonics in, gar in their yards and their grass and their turf, their lawn. Mm -hmm. So I would say we know that many insecti insecticides can hurt bees. We're learning a lot about fungicides mm. and their effect on the microbiomes of bees, all mm. bees. We know that neonics are just one of many poisons out there. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of attention on those. But I would say don't keep your eye too f narrowly focused on that one kind of insecticide mm -hmm. because there's a lot more out there that mm -hmm. could be reduced. And in particular, I would start thinking about fungicide use. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Here's a good one. Are there are there other insects like hornets, hornets, wasps, other species that are a threat to bees, honeybees in parentheses, and how can we garden to repel those? So there, um, wasps are carnivores, so they're eating other insects, and they uh, yellow jackets in particular, if they can get into a honeybee colony and get the larvae, the meat. That's what they really want. They'll steal some honey, too. At the end of the year, they are scavenging on carbs. They want some sweet, too. But um, So there are some yellow jackets that can get into a honeybee colony, but only if the honeybee colony is really weak to begin with. Otherwise, that colony can defend itself. And um, there is an Asian hornet. It's not in Minnesota yet. And... If that's here, I would answer this question differently. But right now, I don't think we need to worry about wasps. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned an invasive species. What about invasive species in general and their relationship to our native bees? Wow, that's a big question. So, <laughs> well, I would, OK. <laughs> so uh, invasive plants, then how th might that affect our native bees? You can answer it that way. Sure. So one invasive plant is sweet clover, melilotus. Mm. It's highly, in, it, it is invasive. And it's in our ditches, in our roadsides. And if you look at it, it there are so many native bees all over it. It is feeding so many plant, so many bees, <laughs> so many species of bees, just as is the trifolium, the, the little white mm -hmm. clover that might be in our lawns. So our invasive species... If they're flowering, many of them are feeding our bees. Mm -hmm. And in turn, I don't know if I should mention this, the bees are pollinating them, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the bees are the problem? No. <laughs> well, the, I would say pull back from the invasive species question and ask yeah. the question, why do we have invasive species in the first place? And the reason we do is because we disturb the la we humans disturb the land and that only some species can move into it. They're really more opportunistic than they are invasive. We give that judgment word to them, on them, the invasive part. They're just, hey, I can live here. Mm -hmm. You know, I got bad soil or pesticide residue, and I, I can live here. Mm -hmm. And then we complain about it. And then we spray more things on them to get rid of the situation that we created in the first place. So. Mm -hmm. Don't get me going. <laughs> okay. Um, I just did. Sorry. <laughs> so our discussion tonight focused primarily on the United States and our pollinators here and in Minnesota. So can you speak to the, the state of other countries around the world and are any of those countries standouts in terms of thinking about pollinators? Europe, for sure. Um, Canada, for sure. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, there's many, Asia for sure, but as far as movements and political movements and public citizen drive and motivation to promote pollinators, I would say it's mostly the U.S., Canada, and Europe, and 
most countries in Europe, yeah. So apparently there are pollinator hotels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, these are structures that kind of look like columns. Yes, okay. There's one uh, near Como Lake, this question asker says, mm -hmm. and just wants to know on their intent and whether it's been successful. Right. Some of our wild bees like to nest in stems or tunnels. And so that we can provide them like with little bamboo or um, holes basically that go in about that far. And they, instead of going into a stem like a sumac stem or a raspberry stem, which is where most of them are, might go into one of these holes. And so um, Colleen Satisher and Christine Bumler, who's a artist at the University of Minnesota, and Colleen studies these, these stem nesting bees, got together and um, put together these beautiful sculptures and hotels, or these little, I guess they call them hotels because they have, they're single units, <laughs> single tubes for a, one bee and mm -hmm. her family. Um, and they were able to uh, put up these beautiful art sculptures that also serve as bee nests. And there's one at the Wiseman, and there's one at Como Park. We're hoping to get some others. And then put bee lawns underneath them, flowering mm -hmm. lawns underneath them. So yes, they can be helpful. We do have information on our website about them. You do need to keep them clean. You don't want the bees nesting in them year after year because there will get some pathogens in that tube. There's, they don't reuse the same tube year after year themselves. They go for a new tube. So as if you're providing these bee hotels or whatever you mm -hmm. want to call them, make sure you're following instructions like on our website or other places of how to replace those tubes so that they're clean. I've got a really specific question here, so I won't uh, say all the details, but basically the situation is they're trying to uh, make a prairie ecosystem. And the question is, um, if they invested a honeybee colony to be near there, um, and they initially have that, is there a way to introduce the rusty patched bumblebee and have, have them be part of that ecosystem once it's there? Yeah. The, right now, the rest, there's so few rusty patch bumblebees colonies out there. There's, we know of no way that you could start, get a queen and start a colony and move it in there. In fact, the last three days, the <clears throat> Fish and Wildlife Service has held a meeting at the zoo with bumblebee experts from all over the United States. They were just here for the last three days discussing how do we help the rusty patch bumblebee? What measures can we do? Can we do some rear and, rear and release of these bumblebees to restore their population? And um, I met with them last night, and at that point they were saying, Wow, I don't know if we <laughs> if we can if we can do this, but they were meeting today, and I haven't heard mm. their action steps yet. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered that question. Yeah, well, I think but. so. Um, so uh, this person is wondering, you know, in some places there are farms and orchards that are in monoculture, and then farmers will bring in the bees by truck. And actually, there's beekeepers here in Minnesota that oh, yeah. take their bees out to California, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and so this person is wondering, why are we doing that? Why don't we just plant rows with other <laughs> flowers so that the bees could be there and wouldn't have to truck them in? What's oh, the... so, okay. So the commercial migratory beekeepers, this is their lifestyle. So they'll have anywhere from 2,000 to maybe 10,000 colonies of bees. This is their livelihood. They produce honey here in the summer. Mm -hmm. And then they'll take their bees to different states for the winter months. Many of them are taking their bees to California to pollinate the almonds that are in bloom right now. A million acres of almonds are in bloom right now in California. And there's two million colonies of bees out there trying to pollinate that crop. So we can drink almond milk and Mm -hmm. um, eat almonds. <laughs> Other beekeepers take them down south and raise new queen bees and new colonies or down to Florida. So beekeepers move their bees around. And uh, is that a good thing or the bad thing? The bees are fine with it, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, bees on a truck are a little bit like your baby in a car seat <laughs> when they're fussy. And so they kind of calm down with a vibration. 
And um, once they get to their location, they can reorient and they're fine. The problem is if they're sick and they get all together on a truck and then they're moved over to where a lot of other bees are and then they, a lot of them are getting sick. Now we're all thinking about coronavirus mm -hmm. right now. I think about that kind of thing for honeybee health all the time. How do we prevent the movement of it? But. Mm -hmm. What happens with bees eating pollen from GMO crops? Nothing. So the GMOs do not affect the honeybees. So one of them would be the BT they put in corn, and it has had no effect on honeybees. It might have an effect on monarch butterflies. Mm -hmm. It's a bacterium that affects the guts of Lepidoptera, the group of insects that it has moths and butterflies. It doesn't affect bees. Roundup ready soybeans or alfalfa mm -hmm. it doesn't affect the bee directly at all. What it does is allow us to use a lot of herbicide all around there and kill off all the flowering plants that bees would want for food to allow the soybeans or the alfalfa to grow. So it doesn't, they don't affect bees directly. Their effect is indirect. Mm -hmm. This question is, how do we convince parks and homeowners to reduce the use of pesticides and other chemicals and plant native plants? So what's the... What's sort of the argument that you give to the person who doesn't quite, quite see the benefit? Of reducing pesticide mm -hmm. use? Yeah, that's a really tough one because there's people that really hate bugs. They're afraid of bugs. And one little thing, they need to get out and spray it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think our park system uses very much pesticide, number one, herbicide. I think that as far as I've learned from Mary Lynn, it's very, very little. Homeowners are the ones that are the really egregious offenders, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, not all of you, I know, but other homeowners. And, and I think it's um, a lot of it's just education. So, for example, if, if you, and this scales up, big. It scales to growers, I think. If you're intentionally growing flowers for bees or for the rusty patch bumblebee, you're growing monarda for the rusty patch bumblebee, then all of a sudden that flower takes on new meaning and you definitely don't want to spray it. Hmm. And you might think, oh, I got to spray for mosquitoes, but oh, is that going to affect my rusty patch bumblebee food that I just planted? Hmm. And that's where we want people. You want them to think twice <laughs> about what they're doing. So I would just say, I think it's most important um, for people just to get out there and plant some bee food, food for mm -hmm. bees, and then start thinking themselves about what that means and how they have to keep that clean. It's the same for growers. People say, oh, you can't ask soy and corn and soybean growers to put pollinator habitat in there because they're just going to spray it. That is just completely opposite of the way growers think. If they've planted something, they're going to protect that thing. <laughs> they are growers. This is what mm -hmm. they do. Mm -hmm. And it's huge educational. Just think of it if you are growing a bunch of pollinator habitat and herbicide drifts onto it and kills it. You're not going to do that again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let the flowers be the teaching moment, basically. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, there's another question here about just our, our food system and how in the future, you know, you talked about regenerative agriculture. How, how do we get there? Slowly, mm -hmm. <laughs> but surely. Mm -hmm. I think there's a huge movement toward that. It's, it's, it's a groundswell. It's going to be grassroots. Um, and people are just going to understand. I think economics will show that when you start doing re regenerative agriculture, that the benefits to the soil to the land, the crop yields, the animal health the, that you're grazing for beef, for example, or your chickens are going to be healthier. I think in time it will just be that, oh yes, this will be our new green revolution. 
that we'll need to be growing food, but we need to be doing this in a way that we're also nourishing our soil. So how do we, how do we move it forward? Okay. Well, slowly but surely, and getting the word out. And I don't know any other, other way, I think. OK, we have two more questions here. What is the right time to clean out pollinator gardens to protect hibernating bees and larvae? Uh, so this question is, is referring to the bees that, again, nest in stems. And so if you, the female bee uh, goes into a stem sometime during the summer and lays some eggs. So in those stems, there's little partitions, and there's pollen, and then there's developing bees within some stems. If you go in the fall and you cut everything down to the ground, you've just cut out some families in stems, and you don't know it. Mm -hmm. So if you leave them up all winter, and then into almost in June, and by up, you can do it to about 15 in Is that 15 inches? Mm -hmm. 18 inches. <laughs> about couple feet, I don't know. Um, if you leave up the stems through about June, then those bees will emerge from those stems and then they're done that following spring. Mm -hmm. And by that time, if you have a really big garden, it's, a, it's overgrown those stems anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's just another thing where we're going to have to get used to. We have this idea of what looks clean and tidy and it has to do with this lawn idea. And I think if you're growing gardens or pollinator habitat that looks a little bit messier, you do what I did so I could stop getting citations from the city. <laughs> and that's just put up a sign that says, this is pollinator habitat. And then people, when they're walking by, go, oh, that's what that, you know, OK. How many you know, of you have one of those signs? Yeah, put up yeah, a sign. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's super helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you have stubble, you know, stubble all winter long, um, you still, your sign's still up. Keep your sign up. OK, so last question here. Um, does spraying for gypsy moths, and gy gypsy moths are an invasive uh, species, does spraying for them impact pollinators? And it says here specifically resin concoction. I don't, know what a resin, I don't know the resin yeah. concoction. Well, let's just talk about spraying gypsy moths. So spraying for gypsy moths would be with an insecticide. I don't know what insecticide they would use. And um, if gypsy moths are generally in forested areas, so bee, many bees do live in forests. Honeybees tend not to live in really dense forests. But really what we need to be paying attention, attention to if we're going, if insecticides or any pesticide must be used, is keeping it where it's applied. The damage to pollinators happens when it moves off the target. So you're spraying mosquitoes and it's moving on to flowering plants, or you're spraying um, corn or soybean and it's moving on to adjacent flowers. So it's really important just to avoid that drift. And the same would be mm -hmm. for gypsy moths, mm -hmm. is just to come up. I would really like to see in the future drone delivery or robot delivery or precision agriculture delivering only a little bit of pesticide here where it's needed mm. so it's not blowing across the landscape and causing widespread contamination. Mm -hmm. So that's another topic I can go on about. But. Thank you for answering <laughs> our questions. Thank you. Let's okay, thank her. Um, Dr. Spivak, Elizabeth, thank you so much. Thank you. It's just, uh, there's so much to think about here. And um, you know, the, the parks are an opportunity to really expand this. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for joining us for the Next Gen Lecture Series. Um, there is, I uh, just want to remind you, there's one more for this. For This um, This one is on uh, May 7th with Dr. Craig Wilkins. It's on the uh, program. Please join us for that. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, we, we depend on support from donations. So if you're inspired, please consider making a gift to the Parks Foundation and definitely spread the word. Um, you know, I think there was hashtags or um, there you go. Uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, but let people know because we want to keep expanding the conversation on many things. So thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate seeing you all, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.
Thank you.